Hello, everybody. I was really tempted to say good morning, but I am East Coast time and I don't know where all of y'all are. Uh, but welcome once again to day two of DevConf US. And uh, just a reminder, DevConf CZ's CFP is now open. Um, and thank you for coming to our intern showcase. Uh, so it's a little bit constrained this year. Uh, we have um, some members of the community that we uh, want to show off their projects, uh, but we don't have a lot of time and we have a lot of projects. So we're going to kind of jump right into it uh, with a program from someone named Fred Martin and his program called Source CS. And I'm going to put up their cool logo and uh, slide um, while we chit chat about it a little bit. Hi, Langdon. Hi. So, hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Fred Martin, as Langdon said. Um, I'm Associate Dean for Teaching, Learning, and Undergraduate Studies at the Kennedy College of Sciences at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. And I'm also a faculty member in the computer science department. That's where my point is. And so three years ago, with support from Red Hat, we created a summer bridge program to increase diversity in the CS department here at UMass Lowell. This is our third year running the program. We have six students who are going to be sharing their projects with you. And this is these are all projects they did in four week period. Um, this year we were hybrid, so we had um, some students who were fully online and other students were able to come in um, one or two days a week and meet with us and do some in-person things. Um, the, the thing I wanted to share with Langdon and with the whole audience is there's a whole range of prior experience that students had coming into the program. Some had lots of experience, have been coding for years. Others, this is their first time coding. And our, our goal of the program was really welcome everyone and support everyone. And I'd just like to thank you, Langdon, personally, and um, Heidi Dempsey at Red Hat. And Red Hat has provided financial support, which matters a lot. We used it this summer to pay our undergraduate staff members who really helped make the program happen. Without them, we wouldn't have a program. And then also moral support and encouragement for these activities. So thank you so much, um, Langdon, Heidi, and Red Hat. Thank you. Yeah, we uh, we really like doing it. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, I think uh, next year when we're back in person, it'll even be more fun. Uh, you know, Fred, I'm not sure how many people on the, uh, you know, you know, at the conference uh, have been to a live one, um, but it's certainly a lot more fun. I think when we uh, kind of are able to bring everyone on stage and, you know, kind of everybody can, you know, cheer and all that stuff. So uh, I really look forward to doing this again next year. Um, Absolutely. But, you know, the virtual is still pretty cool, uh, you know, and uh, I think we have a session later today where if you want some more details about uh, any of these projects, you can come by and, and actually talk about them or get a demo or whatever. Uh, and uh, but let's get rolling. All right. Uh, Thank so, you. yeah, thank you. So first up, we have um, a uh, very bad notes. Um, sorry, so Emmanuel. And then uh, do we have, did, is Zach able to make it? No, he wasn't, right? Unfortunately, no. No, okay. So uh, this is Emmanuel. And uh, Emmanuel is going to tell us a little bit about his project, uh, as you can see on the screen. Um, and that is a much cooler graphic. I definitely appreciate the uh, the change in screenshot. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what you did? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, hi, again, I am Emmanuel. And uh, together we created a 2D shooter game uh, like Galaga using primarily the Unity game engine. Awesome. That's really cool. Um, and so what would you say the, kind of the biggest, you know, kind of challenge of, of doing this project was? Uh, the biggest challenge, I think, was learning uh, the coding language uh, C Sharp. Uh, mm -hmm. It's primarily used by Unity, and I had to learn it to create this game. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Minor detail, you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, as my old joke, you know, at least it wasn't Java. Um, so one of the things that we talked about when we were kind of preparing for this, right, was like one of the kind of interesting challenges is like having uh, the different kind of elements communicating with each other uh, and then but that having to kind of live in the individual entity. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, 100 um, percent. A lot. Of, uh, as you can see, I put up a little uh, uh, piece of source code right there. Um, and you have scripts for Unity, and you work on them using C Sharp. And then once uh, they communicate with the UI of Unity, and you can alter them from within the UI itself. 
Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, thanks so much for coming. And like I said before, uh, I know you wanted to show some demos of the actual game. Uh, so anybody who wants to see those, you should definitely come by and check it out. Uh, it, there is a GitHub link to it, uh, and uh, maybe someone can drop it in the stage chat uh, so that you can go and check out the source code for yourself. Uh, thanks so much, Emmanuel. No problem. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's great. Uh, so next, we'd like to invite to the stage um, Jen and Maddie. And I think they're both here today, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. awesome. Um, so uh, Jen, why don't you quickly introduce yourself uh, and then, uh, you know, and then we'll have Maddie introduce herself and then we can talk about the, the project you actually worked on. All right. Hi, my name is Jen. I'm a freshman at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, uh, majoring in computer science, and um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, Maddie? Um, yeah, so I'm Maddie. I'm basically the same as her. I'm a freshman. Um, I'm majoring in computer science, and I'm just also excited to be here. <laughs> Cool. Awesome. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your project? Uh, first, I'm going to ask Jen, why don't you tell us kind of what you thought, like, why is this project what you thought would be interesting to work on? Well, we were inspired by um, the game slash toy Bop It, and we wanted to um, create our own game Bop It with um, this little thing called a micro bit um, at the beginning of the program. We were um, given um, a micro bit, which is a display of five by five um, LED lights. And it had two buttons and a sensor on top. And if you play the video, you can see me uh, playing the game. Um, you see an arrow pointing to the right, and then I press the button on the right. And then when it pl plays that symbol, I push the button on top. And at the end of the video, you can see me um, intentionally messing it up and <laughs> showing um, the game over screen. Ah, ah, that's always a depressing point in any uh, video game, right? Um, yeah. So, Maddie, what what did you think was kind of the most important thing you learned out of this project? Um, honestly, this was like really my first experience with any sort of coding, so I think it was just like a good experience, like a like a good fun experience to just like get into it, and I really enjoyed it. That's cool. Uh, yeah. So do you think that, um, and, uh, you know, a kind of either one of you feel free to answer. Do you think it's, it was more interesting to be able to do, uh, something that involved like hardware, you know, the micro bit mm -hmm. rather than was, yeah. straight software? Yeah. Yeah. For so, me, like we did some other things that like, it was fun, but like this just, I found it so much more fun to do. Like, cause like, you could actually see like it in person that you've done something. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's totally cool. Um, yeah. So, uh, my daughter actually has done some stuff with uh, micro bit mm -hmm. as well. And, uh, yeah, she was too, she was very impressed with the things that she had built. Um, so it's, it's kind of a lot of fun and, you know, not to mention that Bop It is a good game. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jen, what do you, what do you think you're going to do kind of with, uh, computer science? Have you thought about it at all? What's your, what's your kind of long-term goal? Um, I have not really thought about it, but um, I've always been really interested in the creative side of computer science, like video games and stuff. So I definitely do want to, um, you know, do more things like this Bop It game. But if that doesn't work out, um, I have connections to um, people in the cybersecurity in industry. If you've heard of a company named Splunk, um, mm -hmm. my father um, uh, works for them. Oh, cool. That's nice. Um, yeah, I will say there's a lot of crossover between uh, particularly mobile video games, right, and cybersecurity. Uh, so you could probably marry the two pretty easily. Uh, so Maddie, what about you? Have you thought about kind of what you want to do with CS at all yet? Um, no, I'm just going with the flow. Cool. I'm gonna, yeah. Whatever opportunities come up, I'm going to take them. I really don't know yet. Speaking from experience, you know, I spent a long time as a software consultant, then I ended up at a pro product company, and now I ended up as faculty at Boston University. So, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, so, yeah, more power to you. Uh, computer science is a lot of fun with a lot of flexibility, uh, you know, so I hope you all stay with it. Um, so why don't we move on to our next guest, um, which, uh, sorry, I do have two of the same slide. Um why is this okay? Y'all should see uh, Dylan and David's project. Um, sorry, I'm not sure what I was doing wrong, but you know, controlling slides is not exactly my forte. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, Dylan, thank you for uh, coming to uh, present your project. Um, 
And uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you did? Of course. Um, sadly, my partner couldn't make it. But um, basically, when we were told to make some big project, we both definitely wanted to make a game. So we started thinking about things. And we were both really heavily inspired by the classic arcade game Asteroids, where you fly around and um, shoot down asteroids before they hit you. So we decided to make this game in Python, which was interesting because neither of us had a lot of experience with Python, especially the Pi game library. So a big part of this project was actually learning how to code with Pygame and Python. But mm -hmm. um, we both made our own sprites for this game. You can see them at the bottom of the slide. Um, they're quite small, so the quality isn't great. Right, but right. The whole gist of it is you just move left and right and fire at the asteroids before they come down and hit you. Um, we did have many different iterations of this game, but we wanted to make it really personalized. So the product on the right is what we ended with. Nice. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, it, by way of interest or whatever. So uh, Red Hat actually um, built a few like kind of open source games that we use or they right used at uh, various conferences. And one of them is actually a, an asteroids simula you know, similar game. If you uh, wanted to compare notes, you should check it out. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to play. I kept it open on my like for like an entire day and kept randomly <laughs> playing. It was pretty funny. Uh, so I'll definitely check out yours. I do like that game. I don't know why. Um, so, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, so how did you kind of get to this point? Um, so during source CS, one of the main technologies we learned was Python. So I was able to dip my toes in a little bit. I did have about a year's worth of experience, which in the programming world definitely is not a lot. So, um, I didn't know too much about it, but, um, I've always been interested in game development. So, I kind of just dove right in without knowing much about Python. And I think in the end, it was definitely worth it. I learned a ton and I'm really happy with what we came up with. Cool. That's awesome. Um, yeah. By way of interest is there's been a few games that came up uh, on OpenShift TV, which is the one of the Red Hat ch uh, Twitch channels. Um, there's actually a regular show about game development. Uh, so you might be interested in checking that out or anybody else. Um, so what do you think you kind of want to do with uh, computer science, you know, as a major uh, kind of in the long term? Um, so right now, my I took cybersecurity as an option for computer science, and I definitely want to stick in that field. But I've kind of been trying out a ton of different things. I did a little bit of programming, obviously, with this program. I've also been looking into data science. So right now I'm at that point where I'm not completely sure, but I definitely want to try and stick with cybersecurity. Uh, not that I'm biased or anything, but I would definitely recommend, you know, data science being a <laughs> faculty member in a data science department. Um, so, uh, but cybersecurity is cool too. Uh, so that's awesome. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, and uh, we're really sorry we couldn't have David as well. Um, but uh, why don't we move to our next project and we can chat about that a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So the next project we have, um, I'm going to probably get this wrong, but Brathna, right? Yep. yep. Oh, awesome. I win. Uh, and Michael, uh, thank you for coming on uh, to talk a little bit about your project. Uh, and so this one's a little bit different, um, but uh, from the prior projects. So what was it you uh, kind of worked on uh, this, you know, over the summer, I guess, uh, so, to build? Yep. So the technology we used is called Meyer or Learn Meyer, and it's actually developed by UMass Lowell, former students and alumni. It's basically you know, uh, a website where you could just freely model anything that you chose. And in the picture you see right there, we did um, we tried to stay faithful to our North Campus. That's Selfway Hall. And if you go into the project, you can see a, about a third of the campus which resides in Kitson, Falmouth, and Dandenu, all uh, parts and branches of the computer science department, where most yeah, of the classes cool. reside. Nice. Um, so why don't you, or actually, Michael, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe how you got to kind of into the program? Uh, yeah, so I got into the program because, um, like, I had taken, actually, in high school, uh, AP computer, uh, computer Science, and I really enjoyed it. And then when I got accepted to UMass Lowell, uh, they invited me to the Source CS program, and 
uh, one of the main things that they were showing us was Meyer, which is a uh, coding based program, as Brathma said, uh, mainly like uh, developed in uh, JavaScript. And uh, it was very enjoyable. And I wanted to try making a project that people could relate to considering we're all, all the people in the program are going to UML. So uh, me mm -hmm. and Brathma decided to make North Campus. So. Nice. That's really cool. Um, the breath, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you kind of got here? Well, COVID hit me pretty hard. I had no prior coding ex or programming experience prior to this. I was supposed to take introduction to programming my senior year, but since everything moved remote, they decided to cancel the course for the year. Ooh, that's tough. So this summer, it was actually my first uh, time coding, and I actually wanted to challenge myself since it was like practically me stepping my foot into the water for the first time mm -hmm. and and did you did you feel like it was a challenge yeah it was a challenge because um i've so over the past years i used to um, actually develop some games on uh roblox an actual game engine that mm -hmm. some people know and uh and blender so 3d modeling wasn't that bad for me i enjoyed it roughly but this was my first hands-on experience actually manually coding like models Right. So. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so if you were going to go kind of do the next piece of this project, what do you think that would be? The next piece, I think, honestly, for this project, we what we would do was probably expand the campus more and try to fill up more of the missing like void that we have, just mm -hmm. since this is only about a third of our campus that's only north campus and then we have a whole other building and then we have across we have the miramac river right next to it and then we have river crossing and there's another <laughs> hall because north campus has about a, a dozen halls i don't even know how many there are cool that's uh yeah it'd be neat um i can imagine uh you know using a model like this and then actually be able to put in my like classroom and then being able to have some idea of where it is without having to go hunt it down right um which might be kind of fun uh, michael what did you see as kind of the the next phase of this project uh so for the building we had i think mainly four halls uh being like southwick uh, as breath has said like southwick uh kitson uh, Ball, Falmouth, and all those ones, but uh, there's still extension that we actually uh, to that building that we actually didn't get to, which would be um, uh, Perry and uh, the other part of Ball Hall. So we could probably start there, but I mean, yeah, that that's probably where I would start for the extension. Yeah, cool, awesome, um, and uh, you know, kind of as I've been asking some other people, um, Michael, what do you uh, kind of think you want to do with computer science? Uh, for me, I don't. I'm taking the general option currently, but I mean, I'll just see kind of where the wind takes me. Mm -hmm. It's all, all cool stuff. So see yeah. what kind of sticks. Nice. Nice. Um, yeah. Just, you know, keep in mind, right. It never has to, uh, you don't have to stick with it, right? Like you can, yeah. you can kind of change things around and do different things. It's a lot of fun. Uh, what about you, Brata? Uh, as of now, I'm not quite sure either, but I'm looking more into data science and it's, that's what's piquing my interest as of now. Cool. Yeah, I just uh, taught my first class of the intro level uh, in data science, so uh, it's it's kind of interesting. I highly recommend if you're interested, uh, check out the Data Eight program at Berkeley, uh, which is an online uh, like available course uh, if you wanted to kind of get your feet wet, watch some videos. Um, so awesome! That's really cool. Uh, so let me. Um, I think what we can do is maybe we invite uh, Fred back to the stage uh, and uh, say thanks to all the students. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now, uh, but then I reiterate, uh, definitely come and check out the, uh, you know, the session later on today. Um, maybe somebody could throw in the stage chat what time that's at. Uh, and uh, Fred, did you have any uh, kind of closing remarks you'd like to make about the, about the program? I'm just really proud of all of our students and for being part of this event, I think is a great professional development opportunity for them. Um, and we, we had 45 students in our program this year. Um, it's interesting how the virtual format allows us to bring in more students. So the program spanned four weeks of from uh, when we started like meeting with them and, and supporting them in, in coding. We also had before that about three weeks of getting to know, know each other over Discord. And that was really valuable. Um, and to me, um, really for the, 
the students to get to meet one another and bond with each other, both over the web and in person. It really, I, I hope it sets them um, off really well for their careers at UMass Lowell and beyond. Awesome. That's really cool. Um, all right. Well, thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, maybe we can welcome uh, Sally to the stage and uh, and we can thanks, move Langevin. into our thanks other everybody people. for for learning about our students. And, and thank you, Red Hat. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Hey. Hey, sh yeah. Should we jump right into it or we want to give everyone a 10 minute break and uh, we can come back uh, in 10 minutes? Hmm. I would like a cup of coffee. <laughs> uh, but our fearless leader tells us that we should continue. We so should continue. Then I we should do so. that. So I'm good. And I also have my mocktail from the morning cooking show. It's ginger, ginger beer, non-alcoholic, lime, and grapefruit. It was delicious. That sounds really good. Our chef, Phoebe, uh, I created a bagel. That's I've, really cool. I've never created a bagel before, especially, especially in such a short amount of time. That was what I was most impressed by. A bagel. A, I had a vegan frittata because I don't like eggs. And um, what else did we? Oh, and the, and the mocktail. It was so good. Yeah. That's cool. That's yeah. really awesome. Definitely All right. So, yeah. So moving along. Yeah. Um, our, our next guest, Ilana, um, I have to look at my notes. I'm sorry. <laughs> you all know Langdon because he is our co-organizer, so I am going to skip introducing him again. But I do want to remind everybody that he is now a Boston University professor and no longer a Red Hatter, sadly, but it's the only place that I'd be happy, you know, if he left to go. So I'm okay with it. <laughs> and um, Ilana, we're really honored to have her come on stage with us um, today. She's going to talk about her work. She is a principal software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, she works on the Node team with OpenShift, um, but she's also really active upstream. Um, she's a member of the SIG Node group upstream, and she Oh, she was an SRE also and a technical lead on the Azure Red Hat OpenShift team. Um, she's the chair of the upstream Kubernetes SIG in instrumentation group. Um, also in the, the wider community, uh, the FOSS community, she's on the Debian tech community. She is a Python software foundation fellow. So. She's got a lot going on, and fortunately, she is taking a few minutes out of her day today to talk with us. Um, there, we're going to talk about Kubernetes. Um, most of you ha are working with Kubernetes in some way or another, um, so let's uh, get to it. Maybe um, Alana can come right on the stage now. And there she is. Um, so... Uh, as mentioned, so I'm Langdon White, and uh, we're going to talk to Alana about uh, uh, Kubernetes. But let's to kind of start the conversation. Why don't we say, you know, Ilana, uh, what brought you to uh, Kubernetes in the first place? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I in the Kubernetes community uh, when I took a job at a company uh, where. Uh, they were running these very large on-premises uh, Kubernetes clusters, and uh, they needed some SRE folks for the team. Uh, you know, it was relatively difficult at the time to find people who already had Kubernetes experience to run these large-scale clusters. So I had a bunch of systems administration experience uh, from previous work. And so they said, well, hey, come here, learn this Kubernetes thing. And uh, we really need to monitor our clusters. So like, can you figure out like the monitoring situation? You know, we've got this heap stir, but like, we're not really sure that we have enough observability for uh, most of our needs. Uh, and so I sort of begun this open source journey uh, wherein I ended up looking for all sorts of open source tooling in order to instrument these really large clusters that were not in the cloud. So they lacked a lot of the uh, nice benefits of being in the cloud. You know, we didn't have like cloud-based monitoring systems and whatnot. Uh, so I ended up 
getting involved in this thing called SIG Instrumentation, the Instrumentation Special Interest Group. And I was trying out various pieces of software, uh, like this thing called Cube State Metrics, which talks to the API server and gives you state information about your cluster, how many running pods there are, services, namespaces, that kind of thing. Uh, and I was like, wait, like this is, it says it's only supposed to use like this much RAM, but like I have this 250 node cluster and it's using like 10 times that, like, I'm not sure. And, and it keeps getting oom killed by, you know, this thing that says it should only use so much. So I've like messed around a little bit with this. Like, is this expected? Do you know about? And so I ended up uh, working with a bunch of folks in that community, including at the time uh, a number of Red Hatters. Uh, who were like, yeah, please test this thing in your giant clusters because uh, we don't have giant on-prem clusters that we could just do that in. Uh, so I was like, sure, uh, send me various like beta editions and whatnot, and I will test them and I'll benchmark them and I'll let you know the stats. And uh, thus my uh, Kubernetes journey started. So yeah, it was really fun. Uh, and I, uh, when I got the opportunity to join Red Hat, uh, I was able to move into uh, a role with the Azure Red Hat OpenShift team, uh, where I ended up becoming a tech lead uh, and a sort of regional escalation contact for uh, the Americas, uh, as well as working uh, with two other regions, uh, uh, EMEA, as well as APAC, where most of our team was based in Australia. Uh, and it was really exciting to be able to work. Uh, I worked in partnership uh, with Microsoft, uh, because this was running on Azure, uh, to be able to administer all of these customer environments and build a, a even larger scale platform as a service. Right. Uh, yeah, that's, that seems like a, a really small thing to have done, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so what I wanted to mention was, uh, I actually interviewed you for a uh, Twitch show on OpenShift TV called uh, Kubernetes by Example Insider uh, a couple months ago, where we talked about kind of Kubernetes in general. Um, but we, what we wanted to focus on here today more was um, you have, you know, you get a lot of questions about Kubernetes, I'm sure, on a regular basis. Uh, and one of the things that you keep uh, thinking to yourself when you hear these questions, as we talked about before, is it ain't magic, right? So, um, what what like what does that mean? Let's start there for anybody, particularly non English speakers. Uh, you know, what does that kind of mean to you when when you say it ain't magic? So uh, I put out a straw Twitter poll uh, um, about a month back, and I asked folks like, "What surprised you the most when you started using Kubernetes, or what confused you when you started Kubernetes?" And there were all of these things, and to some extent, uh, I think that people might get a little bit caught up in like some of the hype around Kubernetes and they're like, it can do this and it can do that and it can do all of these things like, you know, happy, like magical rainbows. Uh, and it's not magic though. Uh, Kubernetes is just an open source API uh, that can be used for workload management. Uh, and I think uh, in a lot of cases, uh, like I mostly work on the Linux side, so I like to think of it as a, an open source, like distributed abstraction over running containers on Linux. Uh, like that gives you the magic of container orchestration, but like under the hood, you still have a Linux machine. It's still like, you know, it, it walks like a Linux machine, it quacks like a Linux machine, it will fail like a Linux machine. And folks are like, but I expected these things to magically work. And I'm like, but you still have to set up the network for the Linux machine. You still can fork bomb the Linux machine. You still have to secure the Linux machine. Uh, like there's there's no magic. Uh, it is a knowable, tangible thing. Yeah, um, it's funny. So, uh, you know, Red Hat, of course, has had actually made some t-shirts to indicate the containers are Linux. Um, but the... I think that uh, that is a common problem that magic, right? Whenever we have kind of a new technology that's making getting a lot of traction, right? And everybody's really excited about it. Um, so why don't we delve into a couple of your examples there? So if you if you talk about networking, so what where where is that kind of quote unquote you know I hate to say bad assumption, but where where is that assumption in particular that people think is going to happen with networking that really you you don't just get magically so i let's like say i don't consider myself a networking expert although i certainly have the fundamentals down and 
I would say like myself, one of the things that surprises me is, you know, you go and you look at the Kubernetes documentation and you read about these things called services. And I'm like, that seems kind of like a load balancer, except it turns out it's not a load balancer. Uh, it's more like declaring a load balancer to Kubernetes, but the load balancer has to already exist. Uh, and so I, uh, in you can implement the networking stack in Kubernetes in any number of different ways. Uh, these days we now have uh, what's called the CNI or the Container Networking Interface. Uh, so you can plug and play various ways to set up your network. Um, if you're in the cloud, a lot of people don't realize that I, I feel like a, a huge benefit of what the cloud gives you is just like really easy software defined networking on demand. And it's incredibly complex and a little bit, uh, a little bit, um, it, it, it's like, it's, it's platform, it's infrastructure. So it's beneath the surface and people don't right. realize yep. how much complexity is beneath them. So like to some extent, like the cloud absolutely is magic as far as I'm concerned. And Kubernetes just makes it easier to like, you know, kind of mix and match and move around between clouds. Uh, it makes it easier to build uh, technologies uh, such that you can run it on hopefully any arbitrary environment, whether that's a cloud, whether that's on premise. Um, and so like in the networking case, uh, I remember working uh, on premise and the way that we implemented services, you know, we didn't have something like uh, OpenShift's OVN. Uh, rather we had like, we set up BGP ourselves and then like set up the BGP network on our cluster such that a service was basically just getting BGP routed to like whatever we happen to declare uh, within the cluster. Uh, which was like very different, but like a totally workable thing. And so uh, I, it's uh, also like similarly, if your network dies, if you have a network partition, Kubernetes is not necessarily going to be able to fix that for you. Uh, it will ensure that your applications are somewhat resilient to that. Uh, so uh, it can handle those network partitions relatively well. But if you need network connectivity, it's not going to make the network come back up. That's still like, you know, that's beneath the uh, level of Kubernetes abstractions that you need to have that set up and working. So. so so regarding that, though, do you think that Kubernetes could or should kind of manage that network stuff for you? Like, is that a, I don't think a so. future plugin? No, it's <laughs> is it, that a future plugin. So I think that like one of the exciting things about Kubernetes, at least from like my operational perspective is that it has a really, really excellent architecture. Like my favorite thing about Kubernetes is the architecture. And so fundamentally, if you have a Kubernetes cluster, like I know where to be able to find things uh, when something breaks down because Kubernetes architecture allows you to have this really uh, accurate mental model of what's going on in a cluster, uh, namely like, Everything talks to the API server. The API server is the arbiter of state in the cluster. The state is stored in etcd. And uh, everything in the cluster that talks to the API server is a controller. Uh, and uh, each controller uh, has a sync loop and it works on a particular kind of database object. And if I just follow this flow, like I can find uh, you know, what I need to find. Uh, similarly, like the way that uh, a node is architected, a way that a Kubernetes kubelet works, it's intended to be resilient to data plane, uh, sorry, the data plane will be resilient to control plane failure. So like if my kubelet goes away, like I nuke it with a bolt of lightning, uh, the containers on that machine are going to be fine. Like they're going to keep running. And uh, when we revive or resurrect the kubelet uh, from zapping it with a bolt of lightning, uh, it will come online. It will account for these containers and it will be like, yep, yeah, everything's great. Uh, so it can handle like relatively uh, serious interruptions even without kind of skipping a beat. Uh, if we add more and more complexity to what the Kubernetes control plane manages, we won't be able to use the boundaries of that abstraction anymore to figure out what's going wrong in the cluster. Like right now, it's really, I mean, it's not like super straightforward. It requires learning, it requires expertise. Uh, it definitely requires a lot of, you know, like just trial and error, but I can figure out pretty quickly what thing is broken in a Kubernetes cluster. 
uh, when we start to add like the Kubernetes cluster is doing more and more things, uh, we lose the sort of nice like, well, I've got this thing responsible for this, this thing responsible for this, this thing responsible for this. This is where like, you know, it, Kubernetes sits on top of this thing, the Linux kernel or uh, a Windows box uh, perhaps. Uh, and like, here is where the kernel is actually the thing uh, breaking down. Here is where I need to care about disk performance. Here is where I need to worry about memory QoS. Like, right now, it's it's easy to sort of separate those things because of Kubernetes architecture. The more things we try to pull into core Kubernetes, the more we dilute that value. So I would say we should not do that. Kubernetes should not magically try to be all of the things. There are other things that already do this stuff better. Right. So I think that is a, and that's a, I think a really common, you know, failure or, or tendency, right. Of kind of big projects of any kind, right. Whether they're proprietary or open source or anything, the temptation to expand to cover all the things is very, very high. Right. And so that's kind of why I wanted to bring that or, you know, ask your perspective on that particular subject. You know, the Linux kernel, I think, is a great example of this as well. It's like they've done a pretty good job of not doing all the things, right? They just, um, you know, they just do what they do. Um, and I think Kubernetes has the opportunity to do the same thing. And it's it's important that we control how far it gets uh, if we want to be able to. And I really like your, your point about, um, you know, kind of once you get the hang of it, keeping a mental model of Kubernetes is is. E not uh, easy is not the right word, but it's doable, right? It's uh, it's something that you can accomplish and maintain. Uh, it takes a little while, but it is something that is doable. Uh, I can I can definitely name a lot of other software where it's really not. It's just you know the complexity is so deep and so uh, kind of like cyclical and convoluted that it's very very hard. Uh, so I, I appreciate that as well. Um, so kind of moving on to one of your other topics, um, uh, we talked a little bit about um, kind of the quota and resource tracking problem, right? So, um, and, and so what have you found that people expect Kubernetes to be doing that it's not, uh, uh, you know, on that subject? That is a great question. So I, uh, like this is pointing no fingers at any particular person. The number of times like I, I would be, if I had a dollar for every time this happened, I would not be able to quit my job, but uh, I would be able to buy myself at least a nice dinner. Uh, <laughs> so the number of times that I've seen somebody be like, my MongoDB isn't working. And I go and I look, I say like, okay, share, share your Kubernetes spec. And uh, they've got like, you know, uh, this cluster and they've got like, I don't know, let's say 10 MongoDB instances or something like that. And they send me the spec and I'm like, oh, you know, you don't have any resource requests or limits set on that thing. And you're running with like four gigabyte nodes in your cluster. And there's only like two of them or like three of them. And you have like 10 of these things. And MongoDB needs a lot of RAM. So like your, your nodes are kind of going out of memory. Uh, like, have you thought about that? Have you benchmarked that? Uh, and they're like, oh, no, we didn't realize that we needed to set requests and limits. OK, let's go do that. And so they go and they set requests and limits. They're like, the same problem is happening. And you know, you go at the, and look at like, the requests and the limits. And like, so you, you have the, like, the limit here at like 150 megabytes. But like, you know Mongo needs more RAM than that, right? Like, Kubernetes does not magically make MongoDB require less I, RAM. I thought it would. I thought it would actually go to Amazon and actually buy you more RAM chips and and install them. Is that? Are you saying I, that's I need not to download the case? more RAM? Yeah. Uh, no. So there are a lot of misconceptions about how, uh, for example, horizontal pod auto scaling works. Uh, it just looks at some very simple metrics that you plug into it. Uh, like it's it. You could have it do more sophisticated stuff, but out of the box, like horizontal pod auto scaling looks at like very basic metric and then you know it's like okay i'll spin up more replicas um in terms of vertical pod auto scaling uh so for example uh pod being able to in place say like oh i'm like using more memory than this i should request more memory uh that hasn't landed yet uh that work's actually been in flight since the 122 release uh now going into the 123 release i reviewed some of the uh kubelet changes uh, the last release was not quite ready, but very excited about that sort of thing. But folks think like, oh, it's magically auto scaling. That means I can just like throw a thing in there and it'll just it'll work. Uh, I don't have to think about it at all. 
uh, it, you do have to think about it because as far as Kubernetes is concerned, it doesn't have any knowledge of the inner workings of your application. It's just like, eh, it's a container. I'm going to go run it on a machine somewhere. And uh, the only things that it looks at is when you give it the uh, requests and limits on your application, the scheduler says, OK, I see you've requested these things. So I'm going to schedule things based on that request. It doesn't know anything about how your app will actually run. It's just working on what you've told it and says, OK, the request says this. So the scheduler will pack things based on that request. And then when it's actually on a node, the kubelet uh, and uh, C groups and all of this Linux kernel machinery says, OK, the limit is blah. So like, if it exceeds that limit, I will kill it. But like beyond that, there's not a lot of magic going on. There's no like, well, the kubelet like introspects the thing and sees it's using this much stuff, and then it like modifies these things. And send it, that's not happening. Uh, I think that there's a misconception that that might be happening, but that's not happening currently. So, but that, of course, at least for me, right? So it begs the question of how do I know what to put in that request as an operator or like software developer or whatever, like like. If it if yes. it doesn't know like how do I like how do I figure that out? I'm sorry, I'm gonna tell you the answer that I tell everybody, which is the same way that people have been doing this for the past like three decades, which is run the app on machine, collect telemetry, see what its resource utilization looks like, and then tune based on that. Um, so uh, I did a lot of this uh, in previous jobs. Uh, both like looking at like, okay, well, this customer uh, is like not really sure, uh, you know, how much resources this thing is going to be using. And so like, let's go and like, look at the data that we've collected in Prometheus, like what has C Advisor said, uh, C Advisor is the agent that the Kubelet currently uses to collect container statistics. Uh, and like, what does, you know, the overall cluster statistics say? Do I have enough space on this node? Uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, in a previous talk that I gave at SRECon, I talked about how we also have the opposite problem happen, where people are like, I'm just going to throw some limits on there. And they set like really big limits. And their apps don't use anywhere near those limits. And then they, uh, if you work in a cluster that has quotas enabled, they're like, I'm at a quota. I need you to increase my quota. And I, you know, you're only using like 10% of your quota. Have you considered perhaps reducing your memory requests and limits? And they're like, oh, I didn't realize that. Where can I find that? And then you know, point them at the right dashboard or the right statistics. So there's a, a learning exercise to be done there. But I mean, I think that the fact that these sorts of conversations are happening, to me, that's very exciting because it suggests to me that someone who is writing this application and is now able to just go ahead and push it to production to run it somewhere, they have no knowledge or understanding of kind of the underlying machinery. That used to basically be impossible. <laughs> like that is, that's not a thing that would happen, right. right? You'd like throw your source code over the wall to the operations team and they would do their dark magic to it. Uh, but now, you know, like somebody who has no understanding of like really, you know, what's going on underneath the hood on a Linux machine can be like, I'm going to run my MongoDB and they can, you know, write like a few lines of YAML and like hit kubectl apply and like voila, you know, they've got a running Mongo somewhere assuming that their cluster has been configured correctly. That's very exciting to me. So like it's, you know, like more problems, but like these are cool problems. Uh, and it also makes me wonder, uh, you know, like, did we set the abstraction levels at the right layer? Like, should people have been using Kubernetes directly like this if we expect people to kind of have some of that knowledge? We've made it so easy, but like, we're revealing a lot of really scary, complex stuff now with uh, that relatively simple entry point. Uh, and I sort of think back to when, uh, I was in like a workshop or a talk that Kelsey Hightower gave. He's like, Kubernetes is not a platform. Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms. Uh, and it feels like it rings true. Uh, like, you know, Kubernetes in, in and of itself, I don't run that anywhere except when I'm testing or doing local development. I might run an OpenShift or some other distribution that has all of this other stuff baked in. It's like not enough just to have Kubernetes alone. Yeah, yeah, we were actually talking about that, uh, you know, kind of in reference to the Linux kernel, right? It's like, you 
run the kernel, right? You usually run some sort of distribution, uh, you know, in the vast majority of cases, right? Because you want stuff like, you know, a terminal. Um, so, it, yeah, so I, I definitely agree with you there. One of the things I was going to ask you about, though, is that some of the groups you're involved with, you're trying to improve the information that I can get out of Kubernetes to inform my resource requests, right? Um, and can you talk a little bit about where, you know, where you're doing that and what, you know, like what groups to follow within Kubernetes to, to kind of know when the next stuff that's going to land about how to know more about my applications would be? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, a lot of folks, uh, seem to be working in instrumentation. So I co-chair instrumentation now after having, uh, been involved in that SIG since sometime in 2018. Uh, and uh, there are some misconceptions about instrumentation. We do not, in fact, own all of the instrumentation. That would be far too much work. Um, rather, we sort of own setting the technical direction and the guidelines for various components, as well as maintaining like component libraries. And then we kind of just let everybody, you know, go wild uh, with that sort of thing. So, uh, for example, uh, in the kubelet, uh, there are a bunch of metrics. Those metrics aren't owned by SIG instrumentation. SIG instrumentation will provide reviews on those metrics uh, to try to be like a subject matter expert on demand. But ultimately, SIG node, who owns the kubelet, owns those metrics in the kubelet. So, uh, and incidentally, I'm also involved in SIG node. Uh, but so instrumentation likes deal with, uh, there's sort of the, some people talk about the three pillars of observability, and those are sort of the, no, I, I know that that's a, I think it's becoming more old time. Logs metric. Under logs, we sort of include events because events are kind of funny kind of log. Um, and so uh, instrumentation, all of our, you know, CAPS enhancements, uh, a CAP is a Kubernetes enhancement proposal, uh, big feature request uh, slash implementation plan uh, for something upstream in Kubernetes. Uh, and everything that we deal with sort of hooks into one of those subject areas. So uh, like on the logging side, for example, uh, you know, right now you may have seen Kubernetes dumps out a lot of logs. And you may have also seen that other than like the audit log, none of them are structured logs. And I feel that this was like one of Kubernetes like original sins. Like I can't believe that in, you know, the year of our Lord, uh, 2017 or whatever it was. I mean, the, the project has been around since I think 2014 or 2015, but uh, even back then, structured logging was kind of the standard, at least in the development rules that I was working in, uh, but the Kubernetes components, uh, they currently still, for the most part, do not offer structured logs as an option. Uh, and one of the reasons, why would you want structured logs? Well, one, you can parse them with computers. That means two, you can index the fields much more easily, which means three, you can do aggregation and correlation much more easily on your logs. Uh, if you don't do that, you have to go and parse a bunch of syslog and you have to use a bunch of regexes and it gets kind of ugly. So, a lot. yeah, and fan fails. <laughs> So um, uh, one of the things that SIG instrumentation uh, ended up spinning off into a whole working group of its own uh, is a transition in Kubernetes to structured logging. Uh, so in 121, uh, we migrated the entire kubelet to structured logging. So now you can enable uh, the JSON format. Uh, it changes what the text logs look like as well. Uh, and honestly, it probably makes it easier for if you're doing the regex matching thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, going forward, it would be great if everything in Kubernetes we could enable this. And you know, we're still trying to figure out schemas and whatnot because we've got to get components to migrate to this, and we've got to get people using it. And then we've got to figure out, okay, well, like, does this key value pair make sense? Like, is there a particular space that we want to like limit the values here to, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's one thing. Tracings also in flight. Uh, we just landed alpha API server tracing in the 122 release. Uh, so a trace uh, basically allows you uh, to like look at an HTTP request uh, or perhaps some other protocol and like look at each of the steps uh, along that the way of that request and see like how long did it take here and how it's almost like a flame graph, but for request latency, uh, a flame graph being for CPU profiling, seeing like how much time did I spend uh, in this function call versus this function. 
so forth. So also very exciting. Uh, you want me to talk about metrics land too? Uh, no, I think that was, I think that was good. I was actually going to move to a slightly different subject, which is like our examples thus far and the discussion we've had thus far, right. Has been about the magic being that Kubernetes does a ton. Right. Um, but you, you know, when we were chatting before, you also mentioned that, uh, sometimes people have the opposite kind of reaction is that Kubernetes is so complex that, um, I can't use it right um in in its magic like because it, it does everything it's actually going to be not a good fit for my environment and i think one of the comments you had is that no not so much um and i was wondering if you could elaborate on that yeah for sure so i uh long ago when i was early on in my kubernetes journey uh i went to a workshop that uh kelsey hightower was teaching and the room And everybody kind of like looks, stares at him, kind of stumped looking. He's like, come on, you run Kubernetes in production. Like, you know, what's the simplest Kubernetes cluster? And people just kind of like stare at him blankly. He says, the simplest Kubernetes cluster is an API server in front of an etcd. There are no nodes. There is nothing else. You've just got an API of the cluster. You can talk to the API server. You can hit it with a kubectl. You can hit it with uh, another Kubernetes compatible client. Uh, and like, that's it. And so kind of at its heart, I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, I think of Kubernetes as this like set of open source APIs for managed distributed Linux. And like really that core API, that heart of the cluster, the API server and like everything talking to it, like that's really the, people get really bogged down in like, oh, there's so many details and there's so much stuff in this YAML and like, what's a pod and what's a job and what's a what's a daemon set? What's what's a deployment? What's the replica set? Ah, there's so much stuff. Like what's going on with services that make no sense? What's an ingress? What's like, there's, there's all these things. This is very true. But if instead you try to think of, okay, I have an API, I can do things with it. I want to run a thing. Start with like the most simple, like the least possible surface. And you through a cluster, I think you'll be able to find that like it's it's certainly complex. There's certainly a lot of code. Uh, I have read through a lot of Go code in Kubernetes, Kubernetes, but uh, uh, that being the, the name of the GitHub repo that most of the code lives in. But like you can you can trace it through, and uh, eventually you can get a really good idea. It helps to have a lot of experience with Linux. Helps to have a lot of experience with whatever application you're running. Uh, but you can trace this through the entire cluster. Uh, so, like, you know, submitting a pod through the API server, getting scheduled onto a node, that node picking up that pod, that pod getting scheduled, that pod dying, the pod never coming back because pods are mortal, uh, contrary to a uh, popular misconception. Uh, it's it's knowable. You can do the thing. So just like don't don't get distracted by all of the things. It's it's hard to pare down the service here, especially when you're dealing with software defined networking, but what I think you bring up a great cloud point. offering. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say, I think you bring a great point where, you know, the, you know, like Kelsey's point about the, uh, you know, the smallest uh, Kubernetes cluster, right? It's just the API server. Like, and I think that's one of the kind of parts of it there too, is that like, you can kind of grow from there. You don't have to grow, you know, it doesn't have to take over everything all at the same time, right? Um, you know, which I think is the experience you have a lot of the time with quote unquote enterprise software. Um, you know, if you don't have all the pieces put in place immediately, it doesn't work well. Um, whereas, you know, I think you can, I it's, it's not quite really the right term of to kind of say a gradual adoption it's not that so much as like but it's like it doesn't it doesn't just take over the world because kind of to some of the earlier points it's not doing all of the things it's not magic right um so what i want to do is say kind of on that note it's not magic. Um, I wanted to thank you so much for coming uh, and you know uh, making you know day two of DevConf US a, a great start, uh, and we really uh, you know appreciate you coming by. Much.
Cool. And uh, I think we just kind of want to say, um, you know, enjoy the rest of the day. There's a bunch more sessions uh, and make sure you join us for the closing and the trivia uh, later today. I believe it's at four o'clock Eastern rings a bell, um, but you can always look at the schedule. I'm as you, as anybody who knows me knows, I'm terrible with both dates and times. Uh, so I always look at calendars. Uh, so please keep that in mind. And again, thank you so much for coming and we really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you next time.